Hi, and welcome to Hell of Presidents. This is episode 11, Jackie Does Dallas. By the time he died in 1945, Franklin Roosevelt had been president for longer than anyone else in history. And during those years, the government he headed had gone from being a provincial American power, incapable of coordinating a response to the economic crisis of the Depression, to being a globe-bestriding colossus, capable of coordinating a worldwide military and economic system that would have the unrivaled ability to shape the post-war world. Roosevelt stood at the intersection of a massive working class political movement, the Democratic Party structure, international capital, and the newly empowered and expanded American state apparatus. To millions of Americans, he was the embodiment of the New Deal and its radical restructuring of the relationship between citizen and government, as well as the global campaign against fascism. With the war won, this campaign would transition into a struggle to establish for the first time in history a global structure of economic and political authority, tasked with preventing another global conflict over resources that would, given the advances in military technology, destroy human civilization. Roosevelt envisioned a cooperative arrangement that would see the U.S. and USSR work together to create durable transnational institutions that would, among other things, facilitate decolonization and the development of Asian and African nations. Now, this would, of course, have involved negotiating the conflicting interests of the democratic base, the party itself, the victorious and defeated nations of the world, and, of course, finance capital. But no one on earth was in a better position to find a balance between these forces than FDR. Then his head blew up. <laughs> Harry S. Truman, the senator from Pendergast, a machine hack foisted on the ticket in 1944, by Democratic political leaders in order to oust radical Vice President Henry Wallace, stepped into the presidency with none of FDR's experience in government or his personal popularity. Instead of embodying all the currents that had gone into building this new American political economic machine, Truman owed his career entirely to his obedience to the Democratic Party apparatus, controlled at its top entirely by the interests of capital. Detached completely from the labor movement and popular front of left-wing professionals who would have been FDR's allies in any post-war rebuilding effort, surrounded entirely by Democratic Party operatives and military officers bent towards establishing a global capitalist imperium headquartered in the United States. Truman was powerless to do anything but assent to their ambitions. He served as the Andrew Johnson to FDR's Lincoln, taking the baton of progress from a transformational visionary leader and dropping it directly into the toilet. <laughs> the decisions Truman made from dropping the atomic bomb to rejecting Stalin's offer of cooperation to resisting decolonization efforts to establishing the national security state ensured that post-war America would continue to operate as a globe-spanning war economy with critical decisions of war and peace fully walled off from democratic accountability. The left fought back in the late 40s, but the Red Scare and Taft-Hartley broke it body and spirit. The Democratic Party was once again fully in the hands of the machine operators and bagmen who had spent the popular front years jostling for power with the now-defeated left. By 1952, the only organized political resistance to this new world order was on the right, in the simmering resentment of the middle class, middle American capitalists who had watched the FDR and Truman years go by in a state of mounting outrage. It's summer, 1952, and Richard M. Nixon, the freshman Republican senator from California, is scheming. The 1952 Republican National Convention is approaching, and it looks to be an even split between Robert Taft, the congressional leader of the Republicans' conservative wing, and General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the war hero favored by the moderate Eastern establishment. And on the West Coast, California Governor Earl Warren was also seeking the nomination, although his popularity was mostly constrained to the support of his home state's delegation. And then there was Tricky Dick. While assuring Warren and the top brass of California Republicans, he was all in for Warren. At the last moment, Nixon pushed the delegation to not split its votes and instead favor Eisenhower on an issue of contested delegates. 
The California vote went 61 to 9 in favor of Eisenhower, virtually sealing his eventual nomination on the first ballot. And lo and behold, soon after another convening of party bigwigs in another smoke-filled room, Richard Nixon was nominated to be Eisenhower's vice president. Bill Nolan, the senior senator from California who would have probably been Taft's running mate if Nixon hadn't outmaneuvered him, gave Nixon's nominating speech. An associate said, I could tell he would have rather had a beating than had to do that, nominating Nixon. I remember the look on his face. He looked like a fellow with egg on his face, you know, when he was making the speech. The split in the Republican Party was deep and bitter. The Taft faction felt a number of its rightful delegates had been stolen and that the Eastern establishment was leading the party to ruinous subjugation to foreign interests. This is the moment of an ominous conservative split in the party. Yeah, because at the very moment that we're seeing the triumph of this new global capitalist order based in New York and Washington, D.C., resistance started to emerge uh, on the right, just as it was being defeated on the left. So this uh, political military machine, this Democratic Party fused to this global capital order, fused to this uh, u- labor movement, left out one chunk of Americans, and that was small time, small town capitalists, people who had regional economic interests or l- very specific local economic interests. We're talking people who might own a shoe factory uh, or someone who might own a small business, like even a restaurant or something. This, this is a wide swath of Americans. These are people living the dream uh, of American self-sufficiency in the aftermath of the death of of self-sustenance on the land. Uh, The New Deal, (laughs) for those who believed in the original American conception, uh, was to make a living for yourself in the marketplace. And these are people who were doing that. But they were not part of the groups that had come together to build this order. And in many ways, they felt threatened by it. Uh, Not just culturally, in the sense that this was a left liberal coalition and with all of the social uh, implications that meant, uh, but also because they were in competition with a lot of larger capital. Uh, and larger capital was able to use their access to government to secure favors for themselves that they had to compete with. Uh, and that when they were creating this international structure of finance and trade after the war that their interests would be looked after first which meant that they didn't see these small capitalists who made up now the bulk of the republican base they didn't see any benefit to themselves to this new order this new deal this new understanding of the relationship between government and citizens this uh this new activist state to them it gave it was only a threat to their situation their social and economic situation and in the opposition to the new deal they were formed uh, they formed their understanding. Uh, and the, the main axis of their politics was against the government intervention of the New Deal and against foreign intervention in World War II. And they rallied around Taft when he ran for the GOP nomination in 1940, uh, but he was beaten by the Eastern establishment in the form of international banker Wendell Wilkie, who uh, was fully committed to internationalism and only opposed the New Deal. Uh, which showed where the priorities of global capitalism really were at that moment. Uh, And so Taft comes back in 52, and by now, uh, the end of the war and the beginning of the Cold War have created a new urgency and a new fire around this opposition to a system that looks to be from the bottom, from from the fixed uh, capital uh, position of these people, uh, the coming together of communism and uh, global capitalism to squash them. Because instead of confronting the Soviet Union, uh, they felt like we were accommodating the Soviet Union. Because even if they were to believe the story that they were getting from the tops of the Republican and Democratic Party and the media, that all of these accommodations were necessary, and building these alliances and lending this money to Europe and involving ourselves in foreign affairs, all of this is necessary to secure capitalism's long-term interests against communism. Uh, even if they believed that that was true and not a lie perpetrated by communists within government, which is what most of them really believed, <laughs> they would have said it wasn't worth it. Uh, and that's the energy that got behind MacArthur and his sort of abortive coup was the idea that if in this new confrontation with communism, we have to pull back rather than press to the end, uh, we will destroy ourselves from within. And so better to go down swinging. It is really the death drive personified 
Uh, but by 52, it had swept the grassroots precincts of the Republican Party and organized by, at the convention around Taft, who uh, won the majority of popular votes in the beauty pageant um, na- uh, state primaries that they had at this point. This is the early days of the primary system. They're only in a few states. They largely don't actually uh, appoint delegates. It's just really there to give an, a patina of democracy to the process uh, and allow people a, a sense of participation in a system that is still largely determined by the party structure itself. Uh, and so they came to the convention with a headwind of steam, but were thwarted uh, by a, com- a combined effort of the Demo- Republicans, Eastern Wing, uh, and the media to foist uh, Eisenhower onto them. And that really is the, uh, the primal scene of the modern conservative movement. And this history of the Republican Party from 52 to now is this steady march of the, the grassroots alienated from the party itself into positions of power. Uh, and it leads to uh, Goldwater's disastrous run. It runs to Reagan's victorious uh, run. But then now in the decaying tailspin of capitalism, when all the deals have fallen through, uh, uh, it is now in the form of uh, protean Trumpism, which is now finally taking power in a way that uh, it hadn't been able to do until this point. But this whole uh, this, this schism from 52 defines the history of the party and the history of Republicans' uh, relationship to their party. The, one of the main reasons Republicans will drive their elected officials to the right uh, in a way that li- Democratic voters can't is that they don't care if they lose. They don't have an institutional commitment to the Republican Party the way that Democratic voters do to theirs. And it's because they have been, they're trained and brought up in a relationship that sees the party as part of this structure of systems that oppress them. So Eisenhower gets the Republican nomination. But the thing is, Eisenhower wasn't necessarily even a Republican. With his insane war hero popularity, Eisenhower had been courted by both parties. And many of his supporters were Democrats as well. In fact, the push to draft Eisenhower had begun among Democrats, and in 47, Harry Truman had even suggested Eisenhower run with Truman as vice president to defeat a potential MacArthur Republican run. After privately declaring himself a Republican to party leaders, then winning a write-in campaign to the New Hampshire primary, Eisenhower finally relented his non-declaration and submitted to the Republican nomination process. We see with the betrayal, basically, of the New Deal coalition by Truman you see the collapse of the legitimacy of the Democratic Party that had overseen this new consensus. Uh, It had been really held together by the charismatic persona of FDR, who combined all of the uh, elements of the Democratic Party. The idealism uh, of the urban liberals, the uh, class consciousness and solidarity of the the labor movement, uh, and also the structure, the party structure of the Democratic machine. Uh, And he embodied them all. Uh, And then, given the choice in 44 about who to put on the ticket, the powers that be chose the machine over the heart, the the muscle over the spirit, uh, and left us with just sort of this skeleton in the form of Truman, uh, which destroyed the Democratic Party's ability to embody this new consensus credibly. And so, thanks thanks to the fact that we have a two-party system, the Republican Party, which was at this point at the top as committed to this post-war consensus as the Democrats, they were collaborating on it with these new state apparatus, with uh, the formations of capital and industry. They were building it together. And so, since they were able to basically dictate their nominee, they figured that as in previous times when an America is in a protean moment and there has to be a direction from above to... Uh, to facilitate a new consensus that avoids and sublimates the critical uh, class questions, they found a guy on a horseback, the man who uh, had full uh, the commitment and the uh, faith of the nation because of his military service in defense of it. And Grant was that guy after the Civil War. Uh, Washington was that guy after the, front, the American Revolution. And Eisenhower is him uh, is our guy after World War II. The last the last capstone figure uh, to be brought in from 
uh, our military tradition because this is the last time we had a guy who fucking won anything. <laughs> By 1952, President Harry Truman's approval was underwater. And after tanking in early primaries, he declined to run for a third term. Democrat Party bosses coalesced around Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. Stevenson hoped to bridge some of the more professional elements of the Democratic Party with its broad base and traditional Southern roots. A possibly apocryphal quote from the Times sums up his campaign. A supporter says to Stevenson, Sir, you have the vote of every thinking American. Stevenson responds, That's good, but I need a majority. Yep, this is the, this is the rise of the nerds. Uh, and it's... It's the revenge of the nerds, really. It's the revenge of the progressive nerds who had had the party sort of taken from them uh, by the by the wor- late working class in the form of uh, its participation uh, in the Democratic Party. But that energy, that momentum, that spirit had been exercised over the course of the Truman administration. And so that meant that the class character, the class project of the Democratic Party was abolished, essentially. And it was replaced by uh, a consensus politics around this new militarized welfare state. Uh, And in that case, the only energy you're going to have is going to come from the social end, and that is going to be invested most heavily, not by working class people, but by liberal, professional, uh, and bourgeois people who are looking to exercise their guilt related to their class position. Uh, And so that means that we will see as the Democratic Party uh, loses over time its economic raison debt, the the rise and the total domination of the urban liberal as as the uh, presiding uh, light of the party. And it all starts with eggheaded Adlai Stevenson trying to nerd his way into the White House against the fucking swinging dick. Uh, conqueror of <laughs> Europe. Uh, you can't get a more virgin versus Chad. There is no more virgin versus Chad election in American history than Eisenhower versus Stevenson. So Dwight crushes Adlai in the Electoral College, 442 to 89. Woo! Adlai picking up only the solid South. By golly gosh, America really did like Ike. We love Ike, don't we, folks? Ike. <laughs> Dwight David Eisenhower was born on October 14, 1890. Though born in Denison, Texas, the family relocated to Abilene, Kansas shortly after his birth, and he would consider Kansas his home state. His parents were deeply religious, originally Mennonites and then later part of a sect that would evolve to become Jehovah's Witnesses. Eisenhower's decision to enlist in West Point disheartened his pacifist mother, but Dwight accepted appointment there in 1911. In West Point, he was an average student, though enthusiastic sportsman, playing football, fencing, gymnastics, boxing, horseback riding, and cheerleading. After graduation and the outbreak of World War I, Eisenhower was eager for combat duty, but to his frustration received a number of stateside training and organizational commands, which he excelled at. Between the wars, Eisenhower was posted to various domestic commands, receiving military training, and was eventually assigned to the staff of various generals, including Douglas MacArthur. Under MacArthur, Eisenhower aided in the clearing of the Bonus Army encampment in 1932, and later in the Philippines in 1935 as military advisor. During this time, Eisenhower developed disagreements with MacArthur's leadership. In 1939, Eisenhower returned to the U.S. and held several commands in various U.S. forts and training maneuvers, reaching the rank of Brigadier General and developing a reputation for administration. As World War II broke out, Eisenhower was promoted up the chain of command, eventually being placed in command of Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of North Africa, which he planned from secret tunnels under the Rock of Gibraltar, which is undeniably cool. Eisenhower commanded the successful push through North Africa and then into Sicily. He was then reassigned as Supreme Allied Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force and charged with carrying out Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy, D-Day, you know, the, the History Channel stuff, the stuff that makes him a hero of dads nationwide ever since. Throughout all this, Eisenhower displayed not only prowess of martial command, but the ability to navigate the political and interpersonal negotiation between civilian and military leaders. 
Eisenhower was promoted to General of the Army in December 1944, as his forces repelled Nazi counteroffenses in the West and the Red Army closed in on Berlin in the East. I mean, as always, not too much time for the war stuff, but Matt, do you have any takes on Eisenhower as a general? Well, bear in mind, I, I don't watch the History Channel very much, so uh, I, there's no way I know anything near as much about Eisenhower as a general as, yeah, your average uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, but he strikes me as a, a product of a system, a guy whose brilliance uh, and ability come from his ability to adapt to the demands of a given structure, to n not imposing his will upon it in any way, but just uh, acceding to its dictates. Uh, and his real skill uh, in Europe was managing the egos of all the prima donna freaks uh, yes. that he was managing, uh, like Patton and uh, Montgomery. Although Eisenhower, which I, I I think is interesting, who is Eisenhower is sort of the least flamboyant of the of the World War II generals. I mean, a lot of those guys were absolute howling mutants. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, my God, Bull Halsey, him, uh, 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 MacArthur, of course. But anyway. He, at one point during in the war, uh, he fell in love with his female Jeep driver, uh, and he became so enamored of her that he wrote a resignation letter to George Marshall saying that he was going to quit the army so that he could divorce Mamie and marry his driver. And Marshall just kind of tore it up and said, Dwight, there's a goddamn war on. It's World War II. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Get your head in the game. And he said, sorry. And then that seems like the only real like flight of romantic fancy he ever allowed himself. After that, he was all business. After the Nazi surrender, Eisenhower was military governor of the American occupation of Germany, where he notably commanded significant documentation of Nazi war crimes and Holocaust evidence and denazification. Returning home, Eisenhower became somewhat oddly the president of Columbia University in 1948. His time as Columbia president was seen as a, a little tense between himself and some faculty, uh, but he gained experience in civilian economic and political policy and promoted education as a bedrock of democracy. As well, he established or promoted several institutions of international study, including the Institute of War and Peace Studies and the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the uh, lasting value of which is up to others to comment on. As we mentioned before, Eisenhower for president pushes had been going on as far back as 1943 and were definite by 1948 and deafening by 1952. And so Dwight finally gives up on the pretensions of being just a career soldier and becomes one of the few guys who kind of sincerely pulls off an if nominated, I will serve deal and moves into the White House in 1953. So the stage for the Eisenhower presidency is made with these two major set pieces. The growing push for Cold War between the U.S. and its allies and the Soviet Union and theirs, and the now firmly set baseline of New Deal economic and social policies for American domestic life. Matt, let's look at the Cold War. Is it or is it not, in fact, heating up? Oh, it's, it's heating up. It's like a game of, uh, of NBA Jam. Uh, <laughs> what we are seeing here uh, in the early 50s, uh, as, as the post-New Deal consensus, this, this new New Deal uh, where the momentum has essentially been stopped and we have what amounts to a, uh, an armistice between uh, labor and uh, capital, the, the tragedy of which is that many of the people left in labor the, from the purges of the Red Scare uh, think that they're signing a, a permanent peace treaty, uh, whereas capital knows that they are only signing a temporary armistice. And it's that it's that uh, asymmetry that ends up leading to the total breaking of labor power in the political sphere. Uh, but internationally, what's facilitating this, uh, this new deal for American workers uh, is the continued access uh, at a colonial point of exploitation uh, of third world uh, raw materials, which would go into the manufacturing of goods in America, the sole industrial workhouse of the world in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, and so that meant fighting communism, quote unquote, but what the Cold War was more than anything, much more than a conflict with the Soviet Union, was a conflict uh, with the formerly colonialized people uh, of the European empires uh, and the United States capital system, seeking to instead of bringing capitalism to them and developing it the way it was in the United States, 
uh, through protective tariffs and through domestic industry, uh, it, their economies would be based on uh, extra- simple extraction, minimizing costs. Uh, and carrying that out required the creation of a vast network uh, of intelligence agencies uh, and operatives, all of them coordinated by new bureaucracies such as the Central Intelligence Agency uh, and the National Security Council, none of which are democratically accountable. They are government bureaucracies in the same way as any other, which means they have an internal uh, system of decision-making that is hidden. And in the case of the new intelligence community, uh, legally hidden from public scrutiny, which means that we're creating institutions here to uh, protect American interests that define American interests with no democratic input. <laughs> uh, and so we are seeing here the uh, continued process of critical decisive nodes in a democratic system being taken out of democratic control as the system becomes more complicated and more intensively capitalist. We saw it with the, re-impos- the imposition of the gold standard after the Civil War. We saw it with the creation of the Federal Reserve, uh, the, the uh, enshrining of, uh, of judicial review in the judiciary. Uh, and then the culmination of this is the creation of uh, gl- the global dollar reserve currency uh, and the national security and intelligence state. All of these institutions now determining uh, the buying and selling, uh, the waging of war, the rising and falling of democracies across the globe, none of which... Uh, are under any democratic accountability uh, and all of which depend on the uh, uh, on the oversight of a democratic process that is in many ways subordinate and vulnerable to it, meaning that democracy is fundamentally being uh, redefined out of existence mm-hmm. by these new structures. So then we turn to the home front. We've covered FDR and Truman's push to bring the New Deal as far as political reality would take it. Now, basically two decades into the program, we have kind of a new baseline for the American social contract. Yes. So we've talked about Taft-Hartley and the Red Scare, and those were the stick that was, ri- that was used to drive down the ambitions of the American working class. But there was a carrot, and the carrot was the GI Bill, Labor Peace, uh, and the Federal Housing Administration. Uh, they, they were able, the capital stopped New Deal momentum uh, by uh, purging the communists, uh, uh, breaking the machinery of uh, labor organizing, but also by buying off, essentially, the rank and file uh, and the remaining leadership of the unions uh, through an offer of partnership in a post-war uh, imperial project. So the, unions of le- the leaders of unions gain influence on corporate boards. Uh, rank and file union members are assured access to cheap homes through the new Homestead Act vision uh, that is no longer self-sustaining. You can't work the land that you have and take yourself out of the workforce if you don't want to uh, p- live for wages. You have to live for wages, but your wage relationship is determined by a deal between labor and capital that ensures uh, upward wages and access to a home, uh, a home of your own making you not so much a worker as a homeowner, giving Mm -hmm. you an identification with capital rather than making you identify in opposition to capital. The first attempt to create a consumer identity that uh, transcended democracy uh, and uh, alleviated class tension was in the 20s. But that was built on a very uh, thin layer of uh, credit uh, because labor was uh, defeated and uh, wages were low. Uh, now, in, in the post-war idol, the middle-class lifestyle can be set on a much firmer ground of high wages and ownership, home ownership. The middle-class lifestyle in which all social alienation is alleviated, not through class struggle over control of conditions of work, uh, but through the promise of consumption, becomes the high modernist expression of f- the free real estate social safety net we talk about. And it would ensure that if material conditions changed, labor would not have the sufficient mobilization or radicalism to challenge for power. Yeah, and I had this, uh, just on all that, I, I have this uh, Eisenhower quote, which I think underlines all this. The ability to which a, a Republican president would be able to say at this time, 
Today in America, unions have a secure place in our industrial life. Only a handful of unreconstructed reactionaries harbor the ugly thought of breaking unions. Only a fool would try to deprive working men and women of the right to join the union of their choice. That was to a speech to the American Federation of Labor in, 19, in September of 1952. Just showing that that is the new reality here, uh, uncontested, but at the same time able to do that simply because the power was being diminished. In a very real way, democracy, sure, it's going away, but it's also proving itself unnecessary. This thing runs itself. You got the old man hanging out in the White House, golfing, just vibing out. You don't need to care about politics too much. When everything's going well, that deal seems not too bad to people who are getting the benefits. And of course, those people are overwhelmingly voters. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're going to rock around the clock tonight. Put your flat rags on. So then here we are, the American 1950s, an apogee of American power where the coupling of international power and prestige with wild domestic prosperity creates an era now steeped in nostalgia and mythology. If you're conservative, you admire the cultural institutions and social cohesion. If you're liberal, you admire the social state, a 90% tax rate, huge union density, etc. Everyone's leaving it to Beaver and sock hop rocking around the clock, driving their Studebaker to the new Levittown house and celebrating their GI Bill benefits down at the malt shop. All of this, of course, unless you were black and still removed from this vision of prosperity. But we will get to that. And over all of this, Eisenhower presided like America's grandfather. Removed, patrician, but with integrity. Likeable and a family man, but with a soldier's sense of duty. The man on horseback, as Matt alluded to, of this era, but one who liked to refer to himself as, quote, a progressive conservative, upholding the New Deal consensus with a dash of return to normalcy. And under all of this, like a far side trouble brewing cartoon, contradictions were building throughout America's 50s. Matt. Yes. I, as we look back from this angle, uh, I think that at, at the base of like the the... The American political and cultural imaginary, uh, this era, is, the, is, we think of this era, even if we don't n know we're doing it, uh, the way that Gibbon thought of the uh, age of Trajan in the Roman Empire, the golden point where, after which everything is a decline of some uh, speed or another. Uh, and that's because it was uh, the moment where America's power felt truly limitless where the promise behind America's eschatology uh, of global and then uh, interstellar uh, <laughs> power uh, is set, felt like it was within reach. We fucking mastered the goddamned atom. <laughs> uh, we were providing uh, a limitless consumption for, for a broad swath of uh, the population for the first time ever, giving giving regular people access to lives that were, were aristocratic in any other era and time uh, and doing so with minimal conflict uh, that we noticed anyway. But the whole time this is happening, contradictions are mounting within this deal that are in the long run going to completely destroy it. Uh, and starting with the fact that our project of recapitalizing our former allies, propping up uh, the European countries that had been uh, destroyed during World War II and reestablishing industrial economies there in order to defeat the uh, influence of the communists meant that we were creating future competitors for American industry uh, and a, a situation where American uh, industrial predominance was going to be challenged, uh, an industrial predominance that was underwriting this whole operation. But it was in the interest of what is now an internationalized capitalism where America... The interests of America as a nation, uh, uh, as, as a polity, uh, are part of its calculus, but not all of it. Uh, it has to protect itself everywhere. And that means uh, building up industrial economies in the former Axis countries uh, and Western Europe. Uh, but it also means suppressing uh, post-colonial movements in a way that is going to require increasing uh, American military intervention, leading to the catastrophe of the Vietnam War. Uh, and also, uh, in those glorious suburbs that are being, that are sprouting up around the country, like toadstools, 
uh, you're building high rising expectations and ennui that are going to uh, explode in the form of a vastly eruptive civil rights movement in which the black underclass of America used the tools that the working class had used to assert their political power in the 30s to try to assert their political uh, power and uh, humanity and citizenship in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and also the youth movement of the 60s that has such a, a huge uh, impact on culture is generated uh, and is so wildly destabilizing politically is created by uh, the children of the suburbs hitting up against the cultural barriers of that uh, babbittish sort of complacent suburban culture and wanting to have more. But the system can only accommodate so much indulgence to its citizens before capitalism reasserts its prerogative and starts eating the flesh of, uh, off the bone. Also essential to the Eisenhower 50s is his nomination of former RNC foe Earl Warren to the Supreme Court. The Warren Court is now known as perhaps the most liberal period in Supreme Court history and responsible for a series of landmark civil rights rulings. Warren would end up being the embodiment of the social radicalization of the liberal uh, professional. Warren was a, uh, a lawyer, uh, had been governor of California and a judge, uh, he wa and he was a Republican. Uh, but he was, first and foremost, those things more than he was a Republican. And so when given the job of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he, uh, untethered to the politics of the moment, was able to exercise the, pr the social prerogatives of liberalism, which meant things like dismantling segregation, among many others. Uh, and Eisenhower was very annoyed by all of this. Uh, he did not think uh, Warren would have done would was going to do things like get rid like abolish segregation, and it, he felt like it could have given him an unnecessary headache. But that's because at this point the radical class now is the professional class, because the working class is been is losing its uh, influence over politics. So where liberalism. Uh, allied or un or disconnected from a left social movement uh, is going to exercise its prerogatives where it can. And it was able to do so uh, through the courts, which by this point are entirely stacked with New Deal Democrats. Of course, the most important of these decisions in terms of its intersection with presidential powers is 1954's Brown versus the Board of Education, when Warren was able to achieve a unanimous decision of the court to overturn segregation in public schools. This, of course, led to massive resistance in the southern states, culminating in the conflict over integrating Little Rock Central High School in the fall of 1957. Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus, which just a perfect southern racist villain guy name, Orville Faubus. Now, see here, boy, I guess the Orville Faubus. <laughs> this sounds like every word are falling out of his mouth because you can't keep it in there. Uh, Orville Faubus sounds like an obscure organ you'd need to get removed after it became inflamed. Yeah, I'm sorry. Your Orville Faubus is going to have to come out. Uh, Orville Faubus initially calls in the Arkansas National Guard to prevent integration, citing potential riots. And on request from the mayor of Little Rock, Eisenhower, invoking the Insurrection Act of 1807, federalized the Arkansas National Guard and deployed the 101st Airborne Division of the Army to escort the nine black students into the high school. And so what we have here is the return of the U.S. military as guarantor of black rights in the South for the first time since the end of Reconstruction. Uh, and like then, when uh, force was applied, uh, it was able to assert uh, rights for blacks. Uh, and, for the f and now for the first time, the political will has reemerged to make that a reality. And it's coming from two directions. It's coming from these urban liberals who are becoming more and more, uh, uh, more and more guilt-ridden by seeing the injustice in the, the center of their country, much as the abolitionists had before the Civil War, uh, and then also from this new, newly militant, newly organized black working and middle class, which had emerged through the same process that the uh, that the ethnic white working classes of the American northern cities had emerged uh, from people coming together, from people not being disaggregated in agriculture, but being brought together in, in urban areas uh, and organizing uh, for their own rights and asserting them through the same institutions and the same actions, such as labor unions, uh, that had done so for uh, the white working class. Uh, and so those two forces are now pressing enough from below and above 
to assert federal government power. And so, and it was effective, but it led to uh, this massive resistance that's going to roll over the white South and uh, define domestic politics for the next 10 years. The 1956 election is a replay of 1952. The Dems again put up Adlai Stevenson. Eisenhower again crushes him, despite having a fairly major heart attack in the fall of 1955. Uh, I, there was one quote, uh, I believe, around here where um, Eisenhower's doctor treated him for his heart attack and then released a statement that was like, actually, it's essential for his health that he run for a second term. It's going to make him stronger. <laughs> It's going to give him something to live for. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Eisenhower runs again despite his 1955 heart attack, crushes Stevenson. Matt, anything on the uh, 56 election? Yeah. Uh, Eisenhower, they, I mean, obviously Eisenhower was going to get reelected. He was the decade. He, he, had, he was one of those characters who did not feel like they were clanging against the moment, but they were embodying them and expressing the moment. And even though people were, you know, in, at the more uh, febrile edges of the intelligentsia getting getting antsy with it at this time it for the american median voter it was still uh, incredibly attractive this idea of stolidity and uh security uh, uh guarantees of of uh continued access to uh home ownership high wages uh social upward mobility uh, the real mm-hmm. last time that that was a live uh element of american political politics and not sort of a rancid joke that everyone had to sort of move around <laughs> and so he uh, embodied the moment and embodied it most of all by being so detached from it by being the, this paternal old man who went golfing most of the time uh, and had no real emotional investment in anything because he didn't need to because the machine was operating as it was intended to and if it was then what the hell do we need to do let's just listen to the gears turn and let them lull us to sleep and the vo- and the, and the machine doing it has got the voice of of uh, good old Ike. <laughs> so then the Eisenhower presidency all ends with this perfect little punchline in the form of perhaps his most famous speech, his farewell address, with the grim warning of: "We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations." Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. So as Eisenhower had spent his term empowering these very apparatuses, supporting the CIA and coups overseas, ramping up the Cold War, the arms race, building the national security state, backgrounded and without accountability to the American people, on the way out of the door, he's like, oh, by the way, you guys should uh, maybe look into that. Anyway, see ya. Yeah, a, another perfect embodiment of the fundamental impotency of the office. Uh, this guy spends two terms signing off on uh, CIA overthrows of democratic regimes in uh, Guatemala and in Iran. Uh, he sends the Marines to Lebanon. He, uh, he, he sets up the machinery that will end up trying to assassinate Castro, invade the Bay of Pigs, uh, kill Lumumba. And then domestically, he's uh, signing off on a... Uh, commitment to a war economy uh, where as in countries like uh, the UK uh, the Keynesian stimulus that was going that followed the war was a domestic home production the US just subsidized private home construction and mortgages instead of giving people socialized housing uh, and instead spent um, a lot of the money and even more on bombs on uh, on military on a new military uh, economy centered in the Sun Belt, uh, which created well-paying jobs, uh, both white and blue collar, uh, and prosperity for all, but around the creation of these machines that could only destroy things. Uh, and meanwhile, Eisenhower thinks that he's creating a, a, a beautiful consumer republic, uh, even though he himself has been directing the money where? 
the prerogatives of capital wanted it directed, which was towards this this new uh, machine that would be capable of asserting uh, control of the entire globe, a concert, uh, 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 assuming the continued construction of a new global supply chain. And he does it through these new unaccountable instruments of government. And at the end of it, he looks back and says, what did I do? Well, I, I thought I was making this nice consumer republic. We build all those freeways all across the country so people could drive their wonderful huge cars around and drink <laughs> malts. But, oh, no, the, the actual basis for this economy is a, is a fucking death cult around a destructive machinery that can do nothing but uh, annihilate things, human lives, and finally any democratic structures of government. Uh, and all I could do is just say, you know what? You might want to look into that. <laughs> it really is one for the uh, the whoopsie file uh, of American twenty in twenty first century history. Uh, so farewell then to the last of the handsome generals. Though perhaps fittingly, the last general president we had was probably the least handsome of the lot. Yeah, for sure. He's 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 kind of like an adult giant baby. He looks like an old baby. He's and he is. He might go down as our last bald president. That's probably true. I think that even up to Joe Biden, they're all going to get the Hollywood hair surgery from now on. I, I would say the only way we have another bald president is if he also has an operator beard. Yes, bald with a beard. That, That's that might possible. Work. And then well, that would bring back the beards. Okay, yeah. we've got to solve this beard dialectic before we uh, are done with this I think that's how you do it. Uh, anywho, on to the 60s. Come on, baby. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was born in Brookline, Massachusetts on May 29th, 1917. The Kennedys and Fitzgeralds were, of course, Boston political royalty. His father, Joseph P. Kennedy, was a businessman who would be chairman of the SEC and ambassador to the United Kingdom at the start of World War II. His paternal grandfather was a Massachusetts state legislator, and his maternal grandfather was a congressman for Massachusetts and a two-term mayor of Boston. In 1927, the family relocated to Riverdale in New York City. Young Kennedy was shunted through a series of private and boarding schools in New York and Connecticut, but in his final years at Choate Boarding School, John began developing severe gastrointestinal issues that would eventually take him out of school and force him to leave Princeton University in 1935. But no worries. Kennedy enrolled in Harvard in 1935. Matt, can I read you the entirety of John F. Kennedy's entrance essay to Harvard University in 1935, his application essay? Oh, boy. This is going to be a treat. We're going to get uh, a chance to... Uh, encounter the precocious Kennedy mind here. I'm going to see well, the kind of visionary that was going to take us to the new frontier. The reasons that I have for wishing to go to Harvard are several. I feel that Harvard can give me a better background and a better liberal education than any other university. I have always wanted to go there, as I have felt that it is not just another college, but it is a university with something <laughs> definite to offer. <laughs> then, too, I would like to go to the same college as my father. To be a, quote, Harvard man is an enviable distinction, and one that I sincerely hope I shall attain. Did he write that in crayon? <laughs> uh, that's what it takes to get a Kennedy into Harvard in 1935. Yeah. Kennedy embraced the Harvard man lifestyle, participating in sports, sailing, and excelling in studies, eventually graduating cum laude in international affairs. While at Harvard, he traveled extensively to Europe, the Soviet Union, the Balkans, and Central Europe. He even sailed to France and brought his convertible for a 10-week driving tour, an expression of his lifelong love of having a good time in convertibles. <laughs> As World War II broke out, Kennedy decided to forego attending Yale Law and tried to enlist in the Army. After being medically disqualified for his bad back, he used the help of his father's former naval attache to join the Naval Reserve. Kennedy went through training and took command of a patrol torpedo boat until early 1943, eventually being assigned to the Solomon Islands. On the night of August 1st, 1943, while patrolling to intercept Japanese supply vessels, Kennedy's PT-109 was rammed in half by a Japanese destroyer, sinking it and killing two crew members. Over the following seven days, Kennedy led his crew on an island-hopping search for survival, swimming several miles between nearby islands in search of supplies and rescue, frequently towing one of his injured crewmates by clenching the strap of the crewmate's life vest in his teeth. It's all genuinely heroic in an almost unbelievably South Pacific survival story way. Uh, Kennedy even wrote messages on coconut husks and passed them to native coast watchers to try to give his location to searching superiors. 
Upon their rescue, this all became a national media story and made Jack a war hero. Kennedy returned to duty for another few months before being relieved for medical reasons and spending the remainder of the war in recovery. The following August, his older brother Joe Jr. was killed in action, volunteering for a special dangerous mission when his plane exploded prematurely. And his dad would go on to say, wrong kid died, because <laughs> Joe Jr. had been the golden boy. Uh, Joe, Joe P. Kennedy had his own delusions of uh, power and his desire to be president, but that had been uh, killed when he uh, was the pro-Nazi ambassador to uh, the court of St. James mm -hmm. uh, early in World War II. Uh, everyone was freaking out about Hitler, and Kennedy was telling everybody, you know what? Uh, I think you guys are uh, really judging him a little too harshly. You should give him a, give him a chance. Well, let's listen to uh, this guy's ideas. So, yeah. So he says that he gets pulled by FDR uh, from the ambassadorship. It kills his presidential uh, dreams, but he immediately transfers them to his eldest, most charismatic, smartest, best boy, Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. And he was going to be the one who became president. And then Jack, who is kind of a spindly, sickly thing. Uh, has this amazing encounter in the Pacific and becomes a, a war hero, spurring Joe Jr. to try to top him. And so he, uh, at least that's the family legend, and he took an, he volunteered for a incredibly dangerous mission, uh, took off for a bombing raid uh, of Europe, uh, couldn't get the plane up uh, in time, and smashed into the side of a mountain. Uh, and that left the honor of fulfilling Joe seniors ambitions to, on the very narrow shoulders of john kennedy himself after the war kennedy's father cleared a house seat for him by encouraging the cumbent to vacate the seat and run for mayor of boston instead then lavishly funded john's run for the seat despite 1946 being a republican sweep year kennedy won and spent the next six years as the congressman for massachusetts 11th ha. Kennedy's father would say about this election, quote, with the money I spent, I could have elected my chauffeur hmm. in office. Kennedy was a Trumanite Democrat supporting housing and health care and opposing Taft Hartley, as well as supporting Truman's emerging Cold War policy of containment of the Soviet expansion. John's daddy then funded his run for senator in 1952 when he defeated Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. and became U.S. senator. Kennedy was frequently ill during his first Senate term, undergoing spinal surgeries and convalescing, but also working to expand the Kennedy mythos, publishing Profiles in Courage, marrying socialite Jacqueline Bouvier, and producing a documentary film, The U.S. Senator John F. Kennedy, highlighting his work and home life ahead of his reelection campaign. Though he did also investigate labor union corruption, working through some compromises on civil rights legislation and some legislation to support Massachusetts businesses. And so, in 1960, JFK rallied around the family to bring his dad's money and his brother Robert's campaign wizardry together to run for president. Kennedy's new frontier, which was his, uh, uh, his post-New Deal attempt to synthesize a new... Uh a new modus operandi for the Democratic Party was an attempt to replace that uh, class project that had been crushed uh, in the heart of the Democratic machine that he represented. I mean, a scion of political uh, hacks going back uh, generations and fucking boss among the Boston Irish or the most machine machine boys of all time. But it needed a heart. This machine needed a heart. And it came in the form of a liberal crusade to turn every country into the United States, to give everybody access to the middle class prosperity and labor peace that we enjoyed of course this is impossible and uh in wild contradiction to what uh the prerogatives of empire were uh but it was something that people could believe in people of uh, all parts of the democratic coalition uh could believe in he was able to make enough gestures towards uh civil rights without being too committal uh to not lose the solid south but to also see a pickup uh, among Demo uh, black voters uh, and he was able to secure the, the support of a lot of the party intelligentsia. Uh, and of course, the Catholic working class who were very excited about the prospect of, for the first time, uh, an actual Catholic in the White House. The fulfillment of the, the, the Irish dream of attaining uh, uh, social acceptance and power uh, in the new world. And, of course, all of this embodied by a guy who was really uh, kind of just a horny brat. Uh, he <laughs> fucked anything that moved, uh, including East German spies, mafia girlfriends, Hollywood starlets. Uh, he had an image of 
uh, outward virility, touch football and Hyanna sport, but he was absolutely racked with disease. <laughs> uh, he uh, was also subsequently being uh, filled to the brim with uh, pharmaceuticals to basically keep him ambulatory. Uh, he nearly died as a young man of Addison's disease, and he barely had it contained his whole life. Uh, he had a very bad back. Uh, he was he was just he was a, a uh, an inbred dog basically. He was a ha- he was an American Habsburg sort of like a lot of the bad genes uh, of County Cork being uh, drained into one guy. But he was able to present a image of health, strength. Uh, he had a great head of hair, and around that people could imagine this new. A uh, post New Deal idea uh, of of international and then global Americanism uh, through uh, extending the frontier uh, and and the the place of struggle and definition away from the suburban complacency of old man Eisenhower into uh, the rest of the world and then in fact into space uh, and. The thing is, I say it like that, but it wasn't like this was an incredibly captivating vision in, in 1960. Uh, the, the race was ra- uh, close the entire time, uh, and Kennedy was actually, even after elected, never that popular. Uh, uh, but he w- was able to gain a lot of support from Catholics, uh, which was, but was undermined by two things. Uh, certainly in 1960... A lot of people were not too thrilled about the idea of a papist in the White House, even if they weren't as crazy about it as they were in the 20s. <laughs> the, uh, the fucking but, the Al, Al Smith's fort for the Pope in, in yeah, Georgetown. Not too many people thought that there was going to be a, a fort for the Pope in Georgetown, uh, but uh, certainly some did. And the other thing is that he was really, really young, and a lot of people thought that he just didn't have the experience. Uh, so they went into the race. He went into the race as one among several. Uh, on the Democratic side, and it was not an easy, it was not a uh, coronation by any stretch. So, for the election of 1960, the Kennedys are able to out-campaign other possible Democratic nominees for crucial primary wins in Wisconsin and West Virginia. Then, going into the convention, Kennedy's main obstacles were Lyndon B. Johnson, Adlai Stevenson, and, of course, his own Catholicism. But Kennedy's talented charisma and, crucially, Bobby Kennedy's well-oiled campaign machine we're able to outmaneuver all of them. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting contrast because LBJ, who at this point was the master of the Senate, the most powerful Democrat in Washington, was very much uh, invested in running in 1960, but he was also terrified of going for it and losing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had no confidence that he could just get it without putting his career at serious risk, or at least his perceived status at serious risk. So he's strat- his strategy for uh, securing the presidency was to not run in the uh, primaries, the the beauty pageant primaries, not uh, outwardly campaign, but to secure the support of the senators from the crucial states because, Mm -hmm. hey, he's master of the Senate. But meanwhile, uh, Bobby Kennedy is going to these states and securing the support of the governors and the Mm -hmm. local representatives, which ends up being much more influential to the people who make up uh, the convention delegates which are state party members not Mm -hmm. attached to the national party in dc and that really is an interesting example of uh of how even a even in politics genius like linda johnson can have blind spots uh because if you're in the imperial center everything looks like uh, a node in a in a machine that you can just press buttons on but it's not always the case and that's why uh when they got to the convention even though you know kennedy won a few splashy primaries he got most of his support uh, in back rooms uh, from state party leaders. So yes, uh, the Kennedys do all that and outmaneuver everybody. Uh, and then Kennedy offers LBJ his VP position. Uh, but the reason for this offer has some speculation behind it. It could have been purely strategic to shore up Southern Democrat votes or a simple courtesy to the powerful Senate leader that Kennedy really didn't expect him to accept. Or... It could have been part of an in-depth blackmail between J. Edgar Hoover and Johnson involving Hoover's deep file on Kennedy's many affairs. Verdict? Unknown. Uh, Just bringing this up because I guess, spoiler, it's one of these points where the vice presidential machinations become (laughs) pretty important, Mm -hmm. especially considering the other potential VP was labor leader and civil rights activist Walter Ruther. Yeah. I mean, the, the straight story is, is that they needed Texas and they thought Kenneth Johnson could uh, get it for him. And to be fair, that is a very compelling reason. Kennedy was yes. not terribly popular in the South. Uh, but 
there's also plenty of reason to believe that other things were uh, going on then. Meanwhile, on the Republican side, Nixon gets the nod as Eisenhower's designated successor. Uh, But this kind of backfired as Eisenhower was not super hyped on Nixon and got caught on the camera being asked about Nixon's accomplishments and responding, "Uh, if you give me a week, I might think of one. Ooh. That's a new... That's that's what we call a gaff in the biz. Nixon also did goofy shit like promising to visit all 50 states while campaigning and even after busting his knee and needing to take a week off. So he's like it's like the week before the election. He's wasting time campaigning in Alaska. Uh, Sorry to Alaska Alaskans. Not that you're a waste of time, but just that's not a good, very good strategy in this uh, in this election. Yeah, he he. He got fucked over by Eisenhower in, a, in a several ways, and I, I, part of me does sympathize because Eisenhower was always very uh, – he always found Nixon distasteful. I mean, that's because he was his hatchet man, and he was doing mm-hmm. the things that Eisenhower felt that he, he was too proper to do. But that's just bald hypocrisy. Uh, so, yeah, from, from helping secure the California delegation to chairing the group that fucking uh, organized the Bay of Pigs – he always gave Nixon the shit end of the stick, and Nixon just had to take it, poor guy. Uh, but he also fucked up several times in that campaign. Uh, nominating Lodge as a VP was a, a bad pick. Uh, just showed his his uh, deep insecurity relative to uh, the uh, Eastern establishment that he just felt mm-hmm. he had to have one on the ticket. Uh, and yeah, the campaigning in 50 states thing. It's like, what, dude? What? 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 <laughs> what? Yes. It's uh, an electoral it, it, system. You only yeah. need like four of them. Yeah. And then, of course. Four important ones. And then, of course, he had that debate. Where he just looked like shit, all sweaty and shiny, wearing lazy shave instead of having been able to shave because it was he was running too hard and he was sick as a dog. And yeah, even with all that though, he basically won <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's it did require the votes of of many dedicated uh, deceased Cook Countyans <laughs> to secure the election for Kennedy. That, that that's the important thing to point out. Uh, that he Kennedy did in fact steal that shit with the aid of the Chicago outfit and the Daily Machine, uh, just as they had done so in the West Virginia primary. Uh, and it's of course now that's not really that uh, wild. Well, I think we'll do a bonus episode where we talk about campaigning and stuff. And we need to make it clear, like basically most the vast majority of American elections were in some degree uh, stolen. <laughs> were involved to some degree a a significant uh, undermining of the of the. Uh, process even the legal process let alone you know preventing people from voting mm-hmm. uh so this isn't really uh that out of line but it is sort of the last the last gasp of the democrat machine this is like the last kick of tammany into the national stage uh yeah and i think it is also you know a little like myth busting to you know point out that you know despite going down in history as the yeah like not just the loser in the electoral totals, but the loser in popular culture of that campaign. Nixon coming off, you know, as they yeah. as a like, sweaty oh, schmuck. It's like the, they, they went back at, they, they retroconned it to be like, Kennedy showed up and everyone just got dazzled by his, his g- gorgeousness. And we all thought that disgusting toad Richard Nixon <laughs> wasn't worth shit. I'm sorry. It was a fucking dead heat. Yeah. We, Plenty of people the, were like, I don't want that Mick fucking uh, kid yeah. in the White House. A lot of people in uh, like 1975 saying to themselves, I always knew that Nixon was a crook. Yeah. Uh, swiping their 1960 ballots into the trash can. Yeah. Anyway, so it's a nail biter, but Kennedy wins uh, even more convincingly in the Electoral College with 303 to Nixon's 219 at Kennedy's inauguration, at which he supposedly killed the men wearing hats all the time fashion because he didn't wear one to his ceremony. He was the first one president not to wear a big uh, a big uh, top hat. hat. Yeah, they did love the top hat. Uh, at his bring that back, man. Uh, but Kennedy would you love gives to his... see Trump in the top hat. Looking like, <laughs> I would love to see Trump looking in the top like hat. diabetic Willy Wonka. <laughs> but anyway, at his inauguration, he gives his now famous line. Ask not. What your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Which, I bring it up because it's always irritated me. I guess it's this, I know it's this patriotic call for public service and social commitment or whatever, but that's horseshit. You work for me, asshole. We should be asking what our country can do for us at literally every political decision point. Fuck off, Jack. I don't know, that just always bothered me. It is, it's very smug, especially coming from that voice, uh, this fucking fancy lad who had his entire life paid for by his bootlegging sex criminal father <laughs> asking you to do your share. Anyway, let's get to the administration. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to let Matt take the bulk of this, but uh, let's start with Kennedy's temperament and the array of political forces around him. So JFK had uh, certainly a, a lot of confidence, as you would have to be to run for president at 43, but he really didn't have a lot of experience, and he uh, and neither did his closest advisors. Uh, and he ended up trying to assemble around him people who had uh, technocratic abilities in outside of government and tried to apply their skills to the problem of government. This was the, the further rationalization of the process that is part and parcel with the, the, you know, the, the demise of the democratic element of politics. Uh, at this point, you don't need politicians in power, according to the, this way of thinking. You need uh, technocrats. You need people who know the ins and outs of policy uh, along specific accesses and data and things like that. You don't really need a bunch of fucking uh, party hacks. Uh, but it turns out you need to know how the actual uh, machinery of government works. Uh, and that isn't in the books. And that isn't in <laughs> the private sector. It is in the experience of those hacks. Uh, and so Kennedy spent most of his term largely stymied on domestic policy. Uh, his, he did attempt to address the huge grassroots uh, activism of the uh, civil rights movement that was creating huge pressure uh, on uh, governing institutions and on popular uh, conscience through the, the, me the new media uh, display of uh, this horrible, of this national crime that has been out of view most in most of American history and is, is now on the front pages and uh, on the on the television importantly i mean this the 60s is fueled by uh the 60s ferment is fueled more than anything uh by the fact that for the first time we have a truly national uh citizenship mm -hmm. that is mediated mm -hmm. uh where we are not living life as americans in a uh fixed position where our interaction with the world is limited to our geography we are now experiencing america viscerally uh, at a national level. And that means that the crime of uh, segregation is being witnessed nationally. Uh, and so there's huge pressure uh, and Kennedy has the power to do it, but he tries to use it. And the holders of legislative power who over the years have been largely the uh, creatures of the Southern uh, segregationist power structure, uh, which was happy to go along with whatever the presiding, presiding uh, ideology of the moment was. Free markets and, and business uh, as usual, a New Deal, social programs, Eisenhower in compromise, even some of the internationalism, in as long as they could maintain their prerogatives of racial uh, power, that was what, and which was what secured their political power. And they ex exercised it through these structures. And Kennedy's best and brightest showed up and were absolutely buffaloed by it. They had no way to uh, counter the moves that these uh, old, old racists were able to pull off in the House or in the Senate and the House. Uh, they would, Kennedy wanted to get a tax cut passed. They needed support of these people and, and it, it presented, prevented them from uh, passing civil rights legislation, even as Johnson who had been the master of the Senate, was tapping Kennedy on the shoulder the whole time, offering advice that Kennedy ignored because he thought that Johnson was a bumpkin because he did not value uh, the skill set of a politician. They valued expertise, and it left them domestically adrift uh, uh, and unable to affect pretty much anything. Well, let's get into some of those things that they did not affect. Uh, as you just mentioned, on the economic front, uh, Kennedy took office in a time when the post-war economic boom was starting to falter. Uh, the end of the Eisenhower administration had seen a small recession, and 1962 saw another dip in the stock market called the Kennedy Slide. Yeah, so this is the moment, uh, uh, at this moment, like Keynesianism is the dominant and presiding ideology of both parties. Everyone understands it. Uh, and so Kennedy's... Uh, move to try to stimulate the economy uh, is a tax cut uh, because uh, there are two ways to stimulate demand. According to Keynesianism, you can spend or you can uh, uh, cut taxes and allow people more money for them to spend. Uh, and uh, at this point, the, the, the top marginal tax rate in America under Eisenhower was 90%, <laughs> which I think people have a very hard time imagining now. 
uh, considering how uh, the orthodoxy around uh, taxes, tax rates have, has been solidified. Uh, but in, in such an environment, there was a real sense that cutting taxes on high earners would stimulate the economy through spending because you need somebody out there buying shit to uh, keep the cycle moving, keep the, keep the circulation of capital going. Right. And he was able to secure uh, this, this tax cut, which was basically all uh, his big contribution to domestic policy. Uh, was was a tax cut. Everything else, uh, trying to tinker uh, with programs and expand things, uh, was largely DOA, unless it helped. Uh, you know, uh, the colonial project, like the creation of USAID uh, and the Peace Corps and things like that. So Kennedy had made remarks in substantial support of the civil rights movement on the campaign trail. He also uh, was uh, the only candidate to call Martin Luther King's family after he was arrested. That ended up being a big determiner in black support for Kennedy. But as Kennedy took office, the confrontation between federal desegregation actions and regional opposition was growing to a violent crescendo. Uh, Just kind of a laundry list of actions taking place in his abbreviated term. The Freedom Riders, the Ole Miss riot of 1962, uh, the murder of Medgar Evers, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which has MLK's famous I Have a Dream speech. Uh, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, and the darkly hilarious scene of Alabama Governor George Wallace physically blocking the doorway of the University of Alabama to prevent the entry of two black students, only moving once the National Guard was deployed. So, like, this is the moment of civil rights turmoil in the 60s. How does Kennedy's administration deal? Uh, They keep unplugging it and plugging it back in, basically. They they have... They have no real legislative strategy against the machinations of people like uh, Harry Byrd and Richard Russell, who are just masters of Senate procedure and who hold the relevant positions uh, in a seniority-dominated uh, Senate and Senate system. Uh, and they use those positions to uh, do what they had always done, which is bottle up civil rights legislation that had been their raison d'etre the entire time they'd been there, uh, and they... Uh, initiated all of their protocols uh and you see how uh, at least in the early in the kennedy years that the grassroots pressure was insufficient unless coupled to an effective political project which at the very top uh the kennedy administration just wasn't and so for that moment it was uh, progress was stymied even though it was it became an imperative of the kennedy administration to secure civil rights not for any moral reason but because it was undermining the Cold War. It was Mm -hmm. undermining America's position, uh, most crucially in those post-colonial countries that were creating Mm -hmm. governments in the aftermath of the fall of the European colonial system. And the more they saw America as a a place of racial segregation and hatred of black people uh, and brown people, the more they lost position uh, for the battle for hearts and minds uh, uh, in these places that are so rich in the crucial resources that we need for our economy. And that really more than anything was what motivated at the top of uh, the, the, the political machine. But at this point uh, it's still not up to the task of defeating the intricate traps that had been woven over decades and generations uh, by the uh, masters of the Senate. Now that Johnson is powerless uh, in the Naval observatory. (laughs) communism, the ongoing Cold War. Kennedy came into office as a kind of soft Cold Warrior, uh, supporting containment, but never as rapidly as, say, the McCarthyites in Congress around him. Kennedy met with Khrushchev early in his administration, but the talks were disappointing, and soon after saw moments of escalation, like the erecting of the Berlin Wall. Meanwhile, the Cuban Revolution had taken place a few years earlier, bringing communism to just the tip of the U.S. (laughs) Matt, what are Kennedy's moves internationally? The new frontier uh, means just that. It means vying for power uh, in the newly freed post-colonial world, but not doing it as an 
dry instrument of American imperium, which doesn't work as a, as a social justification, but as uh, proponents of democracy and freedom versus Soviet tyranny. Uh, they, the uh, mindset said that communism was the real world empire uh, mm-hmm. and that the United States represented freedom from it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Kennedy pursued an attempt to uh, uh, contain uh, this communist imperial uh, monster, this, this hegemon trying to reach over the globe. Uh, and in so doing, he w- inherited the strategies uh, and tactics of the intelligence community that had been created under Truman and Eisenhower. Uh, and so when Kennedy gets into office, there's already a plan at the CIA to uh, overthrow Kennedy. I'm sorry, to over. Yeah, there's already a plan to. <laughs> but part of this meant that Kennedy actually ran to Nixon's right on communism and on uh, national security during the 60 election. Uh, he called for greater uh, confrontation with China over uh, the Straits of Formosa. Uh, and he called for greater uh, American action against Castro. Uh, and he uh, accused the. United States of being behind the Soviet Union in the production of nuclear missiles, uh, which was not true. Uh, but this was all part of a broader muscular vision that saw uh, American freedom uh, as uh, our chief export. Uh, but what that meant in practice is that when Kennedy gets into office, there's already a plan on uh, and CIA desks uh, that have been initiated under Eisenhower uh, and under Nixon's direct supervision to uh, assassinate and uh, Castro and overthrow the Cuban Revolution. Uh, and Kennedy accepts it uh, and goes along with it, but he is always uh, skeptical of it because it was not his plan. It was not something that he had uh, uh, initiated. And he felt limited responsibility for it and wanted to limit American risk in it. Uh, and by the time that the Bay of Pigs was uh, carried out, the CIA was pretty well aware that it could not uh, succeed as they had pitched it to Kennedy because there would not be a uh, domestic uprising mm-hmm. uh, if there was an invasion, which is what they had assumed. Uh, and they knew that the only way it was going to succeed is if Kennedy uh, authorized U.S. military intervention to follow up on the invasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they went forward under the assumption that Kennedy would go along once the actual invasion began. But Kennedy, uh, feeling betrayed uh, and having never accepted the logic that there would be an American military invasion, uh, cut off a second airstrike uh, and began a process of trying to cut down the influence of the CIA uh, over foreign policy. And along with that, he started to pursue a broader program of bringing down Cold War tensions, especially after the botched Bay of Pig invasions leads to the near nuclear destruction of the entire world in the Cuban Missile Crisis, <laughs> uh, which was a skin of the teeth thing and the kind of thing to get a bunch of bratty Boston kids to take things seriously for once. Uh, and the end of Kennedy's term is an attempt to reduce the heat of the conflict internationally along all axes and to bring down uh, the nuclear uh, brinksmanship uh, and to push towards some sort of early detente before that had a name. And you see, as Kennedy is moving towards this position of disillusionment with the, uh, the Cold War vision that he had run on, the system that uh, was also pushing for this uh, began to push back uh, and began to resist his attempts to uh, to diminish uh, America's military f- footing, basically, to reduce the military prerogative of American domestic and foreign policy, uh, and we don't really know how well he would have been able to accomplish a real drawdown from the heights uh, of Cold War conflict. Uh, one thing to point out is, is that there isn't really a uh, organized constituency behind him for this he's really is doing it out of the white house Mm -hmm. uh through the offices of uh his his little band of uh uh, advisors and 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 friends uh and he has the growing resistance of 
the defense and intelligence uh, bureaucracy, which has existed before he was there and exists independent of his power. Uh, and that conflict, though, we'll never really know how it would have gone uh, because he decided to go and say hi to the people of Dallas. On November 22nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy, always a fan of convertibles, got in a open-top 1961 Lincoln Continental and departed Dallas Love Field for a motorcade ride through Dallas on his way to a luncheon at the Trademark. Now, what happens next is a matter of some speculation, but I think you'll find we have a pretty simple and convincing story around it. Matt. Okay. So there is a Masonic ritual known as the Killing of the King. And... and You'll notice Dallas is on the Trinity River, uh, which, of course, also on the 33rd degree. These are, of course, 33 is, of course, the highest level assassination uh, at a triple underpass next to the the Trinity assassination was, in fact, this killing of the king, part of the greater project of uh, of revealing that is hidden that brings about the, the pale horse of the apocalypse. Okay, so that was a lot. I mean, you went on for about 45 minutes there. Uh, I did see some kind of glitches on my recording equipment, but I think we got all that. Uh, I think a pretty convincing argument you made. I mean, I buy it, uh, even if the stuff about the reptilians was a little hard to track, but you know what? I'll clean it up in post. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, regardless of what you think of the assassination, we can make some conclusions about the death of Kennedy on that fateful day in Dallas, 1963. To me, the question of... of, uh who killed Kennedy and why is, I mean, obviously it's, it's very vital to understanding exactly, uh, you know, what country we've been living in for the, the last uh, 60 years now, but it is also frustratingly inaccessible. Uh, mm-hmm. And certainly it's and at least inaccessible to me to the degree that I feel like it's worth it to try to chase down something that I feel uh, fully convinced by for the very simple reason that, uh, I can imagine a world where Lee Harvey Oswald, this guy who uh, defected to the Soviet Union, uh, was allowed to re- return to the United States uh, without any uh, penalty, uh, was a FBI informant, was uh, deeply involved with cast- pro and anti-Castro groups uh, and-, and CIA agents, this guy who moved to Dallas and then was uh, became a member of a white Russian emigre exile community uh, that was headed by uh, a CIA uh, contract agent who was essentially his handler. Uh, I can imagine that this guy just goes up one day, decides to shoot the president because he was being too mean to Castro, and then the mobbed up owner of a local cop bar shoots him two days later to save Jackie Kennedy uh, the <laughs> pain of a funeral, that might have happened. And if it did, I think the thing that matters is that no one in positions of power, both then and now or since, believes that to be the case. If you mm-hmm. look at what the, the people in the moment thought, none of them believed in the single bullet theory. None of them accepted the Warren Commission when it came out. They all believed that it was a necessary fiction to soothe the American people, who, by and large, didn't believe it either. <laughs> and all of us now have been living in the aftermath of that event. Everybody running for office, everybody working in government, everybody voting, everybody participating as a citizen in the United States has lived in a country ever since where we all have a belief that it's very possible that systems of government have become so removed from authority and democratic accountability that they can essentially pick the king pick the ruler at any given moment and 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 uh cancel democracy and that means that they govern that way that means that they act as though they're in that world like john john Kerry was a for a while a pretty vocal uh conspiracy theorist about the kennedy assassination he still ran for president, <laughs> not, on a, not on a policy of uh, opposing the intelligence community, even though he had been in charge of the Senate uh, investigation that confirmed many of the basic um, 
accusations of CIA drug running uh, in Iran-Contra, he would still wanted to be president of this country <laughs> where the CIA could just fucking cap a guy. What, how does that limit the political horizons? What role does that have in ensuring that the systems that we think have democratic accountability are in practice hollowed out? Because we've all been hollowed out. Because we know what the system is capable of. We know what we can imagine it doing. Because if and if Oswald was the single shooter, how are we to make sense of our uh, disbelief of that? Our collective disbelief of it, if he was. And that means the actual question is sort of beside the point. Right. Because we all live in a world where he didn't do it alone. And that determines everything else. But Kennedy's death ends the conflict between the national security state and uh, the democratic participation in <laughs> imperial policy. There is, at this point, no more objection to the, uh, an- the post-democratic uh, prerogatives of the national security state. And we find his successor uh, in no position to oppose the drift of that state uh, towards uh, total mobilization and violence. Uh, even as it destroys all of his domestic ambitions uh, and eventual presidency. Two hours and eight minutes after the assassination, Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as president of the United States aboard Air Force One, using a Catholic missile found on Kennedy's desk instead of a Bible, while Jacqueline Kennedy looked on. A young man rode with his head held high under the Texas sun And no one guessed that a man so blessed would perish by the gun Lord Lyndon Baines Johnson was born on August 27, 1908 alongside the Pedernales River near Stonewall in central Texas. His grandfather was a Texan rancher and Confederate soldier, and Lyndon's daddy, Samuel, was a local businessman and politician who served several terms in the Texas House of Representatives. Sam Johnson would have a checkered business career, going broke investing in cotton, rebuilding his wealth in real estate and local businesses, only to lose it all again in cotton speculation after World War I. Young Lyndon got a decent education, pursuing a teaching degree, including spending time teaching segregated Mexican-American children in southern Texas before taking a position as a teacher of public speaking at Sam Houston High School in Houston. That's very funny because he's one of the worst public speakers we've ever had as a president. <laughs> Absolute dog shit. You go watch an LBJ speech and you just you feel your limbs getting heavy. Which is d- doubly hilarious because privately he is probably one of the best speakers that we have had as president. A, a, a lion of charisma, but it yes. just did not translate. Uh, probably because he could, felt he couldn't talk about it like his uh, cock and balls and speeches to the uh, That's American just it. people. It said he was fundamentally insecure. Mm-hmm. And then, then he could wield power privately, but, but in the lights he was always afraid of being, uh, being humiliated. He couldn't project he he couldn't take the risk he would just monotone his way through it lbj got his start in politics as a legislative secretary to a texas congressman in 1931 and immediately began making connections in washington then in 1935 he was appointed to run the texas branch of the national youth administration basically a new deal program to help train educate and employ young people by 1937 he won a congressional seat of his own as a new deal democrat As a congressman, Johnson was appointed into active duty in the U.S. Naval Reserve and was eventually sent to observe bombing operations in New Guinea. While there, he was in a plane that may or may not have come under fire, and then he may or may not have traded getting a silver star from General MacArthur for reporting that conditions were bad and MacArthur needed more resources. Matt, you you know any details on on this trade? Yeah, he basically finagled his way onto a reconnaissance flight and then afterwards twisted arms to get people to uh, report that there had the plane had been fired on so that he could get a medal out of it uh and it was all very much uh part of his grand design to one day be president because he was one of the most maniacally ambitious people to ever achieve the office and he knew since he was a kid he wanted to be president and so he went to uh he went to the war to make that happen which meant not get killed but do something that people will think was heroic. Uh, and he, he, he was able to use his position and influence uh, wherever he needed to, to to play the bureaucracy 
like a calliope and to give him the uh, the service record that he knew you were going to need after the war in order to uh, effectively run for office. Uh, this is also just something I thought thought was funny um, when I was researching this, uh, that all of our presidents who serve in World War II share the same medal, the World War II Victory Medal, which was awarded to every member of the armed service active for any amount of time in any capacity between December 1941 and December 1946, which I like to think of as America's greatest participation trophy. In 1948, Johnson wins a likely hugely fraudulent Democratic primary election for U.S. Senate. This election has everything. Johnson using a helicopter to flamboyantly campaign, a victory margin of 29 votes out of almost a million cast, uh, fairly well-documented ballot box stuffing, his opponent taking the challenge all the way to the Supreme Court. But Johnson gets in there and starts going by the nickname Landside Linden. This happened back when the Democratic Party was still a political party. Uh, so Johnson blatantly stole uh, the election uh, for the primary election in 48. His opponent also tried to steal it because that's what you did. You could buy you bought precincts and boroughs in Texas, uh, which guaranteed you certain votes. And then uh, you, you it was basically a game of when were you to announce your numbers? Uh, mm-hmm. And then if you wanted to announce your numbers last because it allowed you to make up any gap you needed to by just pulling them out of your ass. Uh, in fact, Johnson first ran for Senate in 1940 against the governor, Pappy O'Daniel, if anyone's ever seen uh, <laughs> Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Pappy O'Daniel was a real guy, a flower salesman who became a radio host uh, and then was a U.S. the governor of Texas, and then uh, he went on to uh, the Senate. Uh, and the reason that Johnson lost that race is because he felt he had it in the bag uh, and he released his final numbers, uh, and there was still time for O'Daniel to release his own numbers after him, and it cost him the uh, nomination. So in uh, 48, he made sure that he had the numbers, got him in last, uh, and the contest was essentially solved by the uh, state party and the national party, which saw, on one hand, a new dealer in the form of Johnson who had worked closely with uh, the Roosevelt administration, and in the other, Koch Stevenson who was uh, a prototype of this anti-New Deal uh, reaction that was going to become the uh, Republican Party, but at this point was still found throughout both parties. And given that choice, the Democrats said, we'll pick the guy who's going to do what we want. Uh, <laughs> and they were, I'm, bid, bid me for being editorial, they were right to do so. <laughs> Everybody was stealing it. He stole it better. He's also going to do what we want when, we're, uh, when he's in power. Yes, we're going to pick him. Johnson quickly moves up the ranks as senator to become the minority leader of the Democrats by 1953 and then majority leader when the Democrats retake the Senate in 1954. Johnson is generally considered an absolute monster of the Senate and possibly the greatest majority leader of all time. Matt, do you want to run through some of LBJ's Senate role uh, or maybe some of your general LBJ takes? So Johnson, as I said, is this monster of, of pure ambition. Uh, and it was forged if you if you you know not to get too uh, b- blandly psychological, but it was forged by a childhood of a deep trauma where his uh, politician dad, who he grew up idolizing, uh, and who was a huge muckety muck and wheeler dealer in Austin, uh, was ruined by financial speculation, and his family was put into a position uh, thrown down from the heights of uh, respectable society. Uh, to among the cast of people who had to avoid the general store because they had uh, too big of a bill there. But both Johnsons ended up having to take jobs with the highway system, uh, doing manual labor uh, in the construction of roads. Uh, and this, this slight, this, uh, this early uh, trauma really put Johnson on a uh, perfectly uh, diamond path in that he pursued power from that point forward with absolute and total commitment and he was a very uh energetic and intelligent person and those things can together were able to overthrow a lot of obstacles and he his main tactic of moving through power uh which he knew lay in washington not in fucking austin uh was in kissing the ass of old powerful uh lonely men Uh, (laughs) and johnson collected a series of mentors 
who were largely these lonely older men. Uh, first, uh, Sam Rayburn in the House, and then Richard Ren- Richard Russell, the Georgia segregationist, uh, in the Senate. And in by kissing their ass and 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 taking them to dinner, they were able to uh, ingratiate themselves into power structures that he then was able to instantly overwhelm with his charisma and his uh, work ethic and. Those are two things that aren't really ve- and have never been very common in the Senate. <laughs> uh, and so he was able to find the levels of power in the Senate and begin to uh, use them to his ends. There's a scene in Master of the Senate, Robert Caro's uh, masterful book on Johnson, where uh, Johnson is in the well of the Senate during a vote, uh, lifting his hand up and down to speed or slow down the flow of the reading of the votes in order to and make sure that he can he gets all of his senators there in time for the vote uh and it very much is like uh, a symphony uh and but that was not going to be enough uh so he sought the presidency uh he was outmaneuvered by K- kennedy in 1960 and then he was put on the uh put on the uh ticket where he languished he was miserable as vice president it is in fact the least powerful job in washington especially since the kennedys ignored him uh, and did not seek his counsel in any way uh and he was absolutely uh, miserable there he he regretted accepting it he complained about it all the time <laughs> uh and then to make matters worse on the eve of the kennedy assassination a massive uh investigation into the uh a Senate employee named Bobby Baker, uh, who was Kennedy, uh, who was Johnson's bag man, essentially, in the Senate, was about to explode. In fact, it was set to be published on November 22nd, 1963, uh, but it was, uh, it, it was taken off the front page in exchange for some other news, uh, <laughs> and then in the aftermath of the assassination, it was never brought back, uh, and it, his, his luck, his almost supernatural it's like he willed it into being like he bent the we- the the uh he bent the arc of the universe in his direction because for a while uh it looked like he really had lost his shot uh but then through the uh an act of god or alan dulles uh he is able to, to assume the presidency uh after the kennedy assassination and so on november 22nd 1963 Johnson becomes president. And then we have here one of the most incredible and important years of presidential legislative actions in U.S. history. And I want to take a moment to admire the historical rhyme of this, because 98 years earlier, we have the exact inverse of this situation. Another President Johnson, who succeeds to the presidency in the wake of his predecessor's unprecedented actions, specifically around revolutionizing the civil rights and enfranchisement of black Americans. And that Johnson is specifically temperamentally built to undermine and squander that legacy. And here, the second Johnson, who secedes to the presidency from a predecessor who, though beloved, had been stymied in enacting his most important legislative goals. But now... This Johnson is perhaps the most uniquely suited in both temperament and experience to actually push forward this work and to cement and reify Kennedy's legacy and his own legacy and make the most significant gains in civil rights in generations. As a great man once said, it's like poetry. It rhymes. And both Johnsons were powered by a deep resentment and uh, insecurity, Uh, but it was exemplified differently and that difference was determined by uh, the the moment in history they they found themselves in andrew johnson resented people in power uh thought that they were uh, aristocratic overlords of him uh and sought to uh secure uh his legacy uh through the common white people uh but uh a hundred years of american history passes and someone similarly uh insecure and resentful uh now seeks to uh be validated by the powerful to be validated by a a new uh culture a new cultural center that is around progressivism that is around social progress that had an engine that had been unleashed by uh the uh the new deal uh and so johnson in power exercises his demons uh by seeking the love of every american uh, a, pros- a, a, a a concept that andrew johnson would have been incapable of conceiving of uh, because uh, he lived in the in the proscribed and crabbed world of antebellum America. 
uh, Johnson living in the mediated realm of the 20th century, uh, is able to uh, truly imagine for whatever is individual personal racism an American people that was all encompassing and want and sought their approval. Uh, but be, and because of the creation of this this post New Deal state that had levers of popular participation in government, he could use power to carry that out to bring about this uh, confluence of interests between all segments of America, the Great Society. So where where which is what he called uh, his vision uh, of social democracy. Uh, instead of a Cold War fight uh, for an abstract concept of democracy a project of redefining democracy domestically uh, and, and then exporting it, of course, internationally. Uh, and so with Johnson having uh, a, this wider conception of, of the public good and operating most crucially in a context of a massive popular out, uh, movement for black rights being coordinated through these me- mechanisms of activism that had been built up by the post-war economy, uh, for the first time you have the two things necessary to genuinely address those ossified uh, structures of power in, in the legislative chamber. Because whereas Johnson and his technocrats were basically uh, at a loss as to how Congress worked, Johnson knew it better than anybody. And he set to work applying pressure to those uh, levers that he knew existed and then getting them to move. Uh, Kennedy had been stymied in his Civil Rights Act in large part by sh- procedural shenanigans because that, for example, that tax cut that we talked about that was centerpiece to his domestic policy or t- his economic agenda was bottled up in the legislature until the Civil Rights Bill was killed. Uh, Johnson was able to go to the... Uh, the people of power, specifically Harry Byrd in, in the House, and uh, make a deal with his old buddies from the Southern Caucus uh, of cutting spending, which Byrd very much cared about, uh, in exchange for pushing the tax cut bill through first, which then opened up the floodgates because without uh, the procedural hurdles, the uh, center of gravity in the Senate in both parties was for civil rights. It really mm-hmm. was at this point only... The Southern Caucus and a few of the crankier uh, Taftite uh, Republicans, like Barry Goldwater, who were opposed to civil rights. Uh, when it finally passed in the Senate in March of '64, the vote was 71 to 29, uh, and it was through collaboration with Republican Edward Dur- Edward Everett Dirksen uh, that Johnson was able to uh, push the the measure through. Uh, but all of that was only made possible by two things, the massive pressure from below that made civil rights the, uh, the assumed agenda of good, uh, non-prejudiced Americans uh, and also the right thing to do in an abstract sense, uh, and also the uh, legislative acumen of Johnson himself. And so this is a, catastro- this is a cataclysmic moment in America where... Uh, the government is finally intervening a hundred years later in the civic structure of the nation to assert black citizenship. Uh, and Johnson said in the aftermath of that, I lost the South for a generation. Uh, but it turns out that he was being a, a little uh, conservative there. <laughs> Johnson's prediction was almost immediately played out as he sought election in his own right in 1964. However, as the Republican Party slowly transforms into the party we see today, it gives Johnson a shot in its sclerotic split. There is a house in New Orleans. Matt, let's talk Barry Goldwater and the election of 1964. So Goldwater's nomination was the revenge of those Taft delegates, basically, uh, who had been robbed of the nomination in 52. Uh, Over the course of the Eisenhower uh, and Kennedy years, the opposition to this New Deal framework uh, and to this international uh, cooperative framework uh, uh, was becoming more and more alienating, not just to the uh, small town, small time capitalists uh, who had 
who formed the, the backbone of the John Birch Society, uh, but also uh, increasingly the knowledge workers of the new uh, military industrial complex. Uh, in, reaction was, among other places, blooming in Orange County, California, uh, uh, among the people working in aerospace and military uh, sciences there. Uh, and also in the South, uh, f- former loyalists of the Democratic Party uh, had, were becoming increasingly alienated from the National Party, which was pursuing a agenda of social liberalism that was undermining their own positions of power within the segregated uh, South. Uh, and they saw in this new resistance to uh, civil rights at home, uh, appeasement as they saw it abroad, uh, and they coalesced around a resistance to the Eisenhower consensus. In fact, the John Birch Society, which is sort of the proto-QAnon in many ways, uh, believed Eisenhower to be a communist agent, an active <laughs> communist uh, spy who was... That was on top of the deal he made with the Greys, right? Yes, who was doing uh, Moscow's bidding. Um, and... By 1964, they were tired of the Republican Party being an echo of the Democrats, and they wanted a a genuine choice to uh, resist things like civil rights, resist things like expanded federal uh, government control of the healthcare sector, uh, and and to insist on a more aggressive footing against the Soviets. Uh, And Goldwater, who was very much prototypical of this type of American. He was from a family of uh, Arizona frontiersmen who had made it rich uh, first selling surplus army equipment to uh, miners and uh, other pioneers and then uh, turning that into a profitable department store uh, in Arizona, (laughs) which Goldwater inherited. And he went to the Senate with a pretty simple understanding of America as a place where the government existed to let people to keep the peace while people made free exchanges uh, in the market. And that was what freedom meant to him. uh, And it's what freedom meant to many of these Americans, even though uh, in reality uh, that freedom was predicated on racial and uh, class-based exploitation and uh, the denial of equal access to, uh, to political rights and civic rights. Uh, but for Goldwater, uh, who was able to, who presided over a sort of peaceful capitalist idol uh, in Arizona, it seemed much simpler than that. Uh, and even though he was a nerd with big glasses, who was even less charismatic on the stump than uh, Lyndon Johnson, he was <laughs> essentially drafted by the Republican Party's most motivated activist wing, who had spent the time building a army of direct mail specialists and uh, local activists who filled state conventions and who uh, colonized the party from the grassroots. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, they were able to do that because they had significant funding from many of the smaller and even some of the bigger capitalist uh, firms in the country who also wanted to see pushback against this new consensus that always ended up costing them money and percentages of profits. Uh, But at this point, especially after the assassination of Kennedy, uh, the hegemonic faith in the possibility of the American system as it had been developed uh, and as it was developing through battles for civil rights and through uh, the expansion of the welfare state was uh, the common dream of America, basically, Uh, Mm -hmm. at least the voting population. And when it came time to vote, uh, Goldwater, for the first time since the Civil War, uh, was able to secure Southern votes for the Republican ticket, but he did it at the cost of losing the largest popular vote totals since the uncontested election of <laughs> 1820. Uh, jo- Johnson won 61% of the popular vote. And yep. I think it's hard to conceive of that when you look at uh, the, the recent history of presidential elections. Yes. Uh, it is very difficult uh, to imagine any election, no matter who's running. My pillow guy could get the nomination next time. He's not getting less than like 48% of the vote. Uh, but in this one, you saw a, a just an absolute 
uh, massive repudiation of the Goldwater agenda, which was to resist the Civil Rights Bill, to resist the, the, the imperative of um, racial integration, to give generals in the field discretion to use nuclear weapons uh, <laughs> and to step up uh, hostility with the Soviets, with the media, with the uh, state apparatus, with the intelligentsia, uh, with the average American, uh, all basically with the same program, uh, it was massively repudiated. Uh, and the while this was only really a bump in the road for the greater conservative movement, which is going to continue steadily uh, marching upward into the realms of power within the Republican Party, uh, in the near term, it creates a massive democratic wave, not just at the federal the presidential level, but at the state and federal level, uh, seeing huge Democratic majorities, in fact, veto-proof supermajorities in the, of Democrats in the House and Senate, and creating, creating a situation where Johnson has the ability to pursue his vision of the great society essentially unimpeded with the same Democratic mandate that FDR had to craft the New Deal. So Johnson sets off on his, second ter- his first full term with the goal of remaking America uh, in, and instituting uh, a Pax Americana through uh, the rational distribution of rights uh, and resources uh, and wealth that will stay all social conflict uh, and make America into a harmonious land of, of justice and liberty for all. We'll see how he does. We'll see how he does. But... We'll save Johnson's full term for next week. As he sets about implementing his great society domestically, abroad, we'll have war and be subsequently forced to ask as a nation, what is it good for? It's the high points of post-war prosperity. The triumph of the New Deal expanded through voting rights and civil rights into a truly democratic society. And then the slide into the deceit and decline of the 70s and the right-wing reaction of what's next. See you next week. Hell of Presidents is produced by me, Chris Wade, with our co-editor, Nick Quaz. Our theme music is by Nick Diamonds. Additional music for this episode by Nick Allen, whose music you can find on Spotify as the band The Exclusive, and by Alessandro Takeshi, whose album Songs About Cars is available at alessandrotakeshi.bandcamp.com. Our episode art is, as always, by Branson Reese. Join us again next week for War, Watergate, and of course, so much malaise.